You listen to this podcast because you like books, or maybe because you like learning, or maybe you just like the sound of my voice lulling you to sleep. If it's the first two, Audible has you covered. Too busy to read? Driving and don't want to run into another dog? Audible is a huge library of audiobooks where people read to you like you're a kid again. And guess what? You can try it out for free. Just go to readlearnlivepodcast.com slash audible to sign up for your free trial today. You're allowed to be uncomfortable. You're allowed to dislike the work. You must, because if everyone had the same response and I'd go, Dan, that's boring. Hello and welcome to Read, Learn, Live, the podcast about improving yourself through literature. I'm your acclaimed host, John Monaster, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 11. You may have noticed a slight delay since our last episode. That was due to an untimely blizzard in New York City. Welcome to the world of tomorrow. Today, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with Deepak Unikrishnan about his book, Temporary People. Deepak Unikrishnan is a writer from Abu Dhabi and a resident of the States who has lived in Teaneck, New Jersey, Brooklyn, New York, and Chicago, Illinois. He has studied and taught at the Art Institute of Chicago and presently teaches at New York University, Abu Dhabi. Temporary People, his first book, was the inaugural winner of the Restless Books Prize for New Immigrant Writing. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. All right, everyone, I am here, John Monaster, your host of the Read, Learn, Live podcast. And with me today, I've got Deepak Unikrishnan. Deepak, say hello. Hey, how are you? Deepak, we really appreciate you coming on. And uh, I am so excited to talk about Deepak's wonderful book, Temporary People. I've got it right here at my left hand. It's all marked up. It's amazing. It's a really fun book, and we are going to talk about it and really get to know more about Deepak and about the book itself. And where I always like to start off is have the author just uh, summarize the book and and in their own words. So I'm going to try. This is always (laughs) difficult uh, because the book was basically a response to what I thought I was or what I was supposed to be. So my parents have lived in the Gulf or the Khalij, as we call it, um, in the UAE for over 40 years. And I left home when I was 20. And I was living in the States and I'd spent some time in the States and I figured... I wanted to try and document what the experience was like. And I was looking for narratives before I had begun doing just that. And I didn't find much. In English, I should qualify that, because other languages had a few things. Malayalam, for instance. uh, Arabic, possibly, as well. But I don't read Arabic, so I'm not sure. So I wanted to write a book that spoke about my family going to a place that they didn't know much about, and then leaving it after spending some time there. And as I began the project, I realized I was, I was also writing about people like me, the children who came from these families. So I guess that could be the genesis of what temporary people became. And you could also say that I spent some time thinking about it. And it took 10 to 14 years, but then I finished it. So the book is about people um, who go to a place and then leave it. And the book is about trying to figure out what they leave behind. All right, so that was a that was an excellent summary, and you already answered a couple of my questions. But I think I'm I'm a bit curious to know more about the writing process. I always like to to kind of pick that apart because I love to write, I love to read. Yeah. And so maybe you could just kind of walk through your writing process. So you know, as you developed this project, how how did that look like? What was your every day or every week, every month writing looking like? You see, writing for me is. Um, it begins with reading. There's no writing without reading. So when I grew up, we didn't have um, excellent libraries because the country was fairly young, the UAE in this case. So I read whatever I could. So I'd go to these bookshops or bookstores and pick up whatever was available in English, which ended up being works by Alistair MacLean, Harold Robbins, Barbara Cartland, And I'm not embarrassed by any of these writers because they taught me not only how to read, but how to value language. And then 
Because I didn't know I wanted to write when I was younger, um, I just wanted to do other things, other shit that teenagers wanted to do. And then I left. And after I left, I began getting homesick. Uh, because I was in the States, I couldn't go see family. And I began to write these mournful passages about being lonely and homesick because I think I wanted a girlfriend and couldn't find one. And that's all I could do. Um, but I had a professor, the late Duane Edwards, who gave me a book, Disgrace by J. Kutzeyer. And for the first time in a while, I read a book where the writer spoke about a place, claimed a place, um, and had a lot of intent when they wrote about the place. And I read it and went, shit, I want to do that. I really want to do that. But I didn't know how, um, because I didn't have a background in literature. Um, so I continued doing what I'd always done. I continued to read. And then as time went by, and I was looking at narratives about the Khalij, or Khalij as we call it, or the Gulf, and I didn't find anything that satisfied me or spoke of my experience, I thought, uh, about what I could do to rectify that. So I figured, all right, I'm going to try and write a book. But it began with I'm going to try and write a story um, because I identify primarily as a short story writer. And here's why. I've always been aware of time um, because I lived in a place where my parents programmed or trained me to leave because we were always told this is temporary. We're not here for long. We're going to leave. Because of that... Um, at least in my head, I thought to write the novel, you had to be in the place for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, you needed to live there for a while. And I never thought I could do that. Because when I was in the States, I was either a student on an F1 visa or a worker on an H1B visa. Um, so you're always aware of the expiration date. So your question itself, what was the process like? My response, honestly, would be it was chaotic. Mm. Simply because I didn't know when I could write. I wrote whenever I had time. And the reason I went to the Art Institute of Chicago where I completed the book was it was the only space or place that was available to me that provided just that, time. And I say that simply because I applied to other universities um, and I was rejected. Uh, but the Art Institute foolishly decided to grant me a place and I owe a great deal of debt to Sarah Levine, the writer, who called me up and said, would you be interested? And I tried to play it cool, saying, oh, you know, what, do you, what, do you, what can you offer me? Um, and we went back and forth, and eventually I said yes, because th there was no other answer. And what that gave me was two years. Two years to finish a book I'd been thinking about for 10 or 12. Um, so the process was just that. Uh, me being aware of time, me being given time, and then eventually me being able to write about people who understood time. Hmm. It's a really interesting way of connecting what your process was like with the characters in the book itself, who are, like you said, dealing with time constantly. Yeah. And so maybe, speaking of that, tell me about a time that something you wrote surprised you. You know, maybe something that you learned along the way or just something a character did that, that you weren't expecting. I guess you could say that when I started to write, I thought there was only one way to write, to explain what this world that I was writing about was supposed to be. And I felt that way simply because I thought folks here, when I say here, I mean the States, wouldn't understand what I was getting at. So I tried my best to explain what this creature could be. And when I say creature, I mean the guest worker, or the migrant worker, or the immigrant of the Gulf of the Khalij, uh, who are very different to immigrants who live here in the States. But then I started getting very antsy and agitated because there was something missing and I couldn't figure out what was missing. And I realized as I really started to write that what I primarily wanted to do was toy with language or mm -hmm. toy with languages, multiple languages. And it took, me, it took me a bit of time to figure out why that was. And I, th I think it's because I started reading writers of cities, so to speak, I remember reading Teju Cole and then reading Dybeck and, you know, someone referenced Bello and I mentioned Kutsea earlier, but there's also Nadine Gordimer and then Ulubis' notes from No Man's Land. And I realized that when I'm reading these works, I knew what these places sounded like. It's a, I mean, it's as though everything was clear. 
in my year anyway. And I wanted to do that with the book. And I realized as I started reading what I was writing that there was English in there. But the sort of English that I grew up with, taught in an Indian school by Indian teachers. There was Malayalam in there, which is what my parents speak, the first language I heard. And there was Arabic in there, which absolutely surprised me because I've learned Arabic. You know, when I was a kid, we had to learn it in school. So I know what the alphabet looks like. I can read it out for you, but I don't know what I'm reading mm. because we couldn't practice the language. But I missed it. And words from Arabic started appearing in the book. So I realized then that I was creating characters who operated with multiple languages, but most of those languages were broken, but operational, like I said, uh, which was interesting. That really surprised me. I didn't think it was revolutionary because you know, if you read um, Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children, he's a wizard with language. You know, if you read Arundhati Roy's God of Small Things, um, again, the woman is a wizard with language. But I guess I wasn't reading anything about the Gulf that used the languages that I associated with the Gulf. Um, th and this was in response to the narratives that I was hearing about the Gulf. And that surprised me, simply because I didn't realize that I'd internalized so many things and they were coming out not only in the stories, but in the sentences too. So my hope is when someone picks up the book and they read it, they go, what the fuck is that? Uh, we haven't heard a city like that. Mm. Or we have heard of the city, but we didn't know it could sound like that. Or we didn't know, we didn't realize that an artist who is a product pr uh, of the city, a proud product of the city, could be like that. Uh, so, so that would be my response, because I didn't think I could do that. Mm. Um, and I wasn't planning on doing it. It just happened. Yeah, and that, that sort of nicely leads into something else I was curious about, which was... It, the fact that you do kind of intersperse the book with lots of languages and lots of phrases. And I definitely ran into lots of things that I had never seen before right. as far as language. So, you know, I was thinking to the, about how, how worried you might be about people kind of hitting, hitting that, you know, and there are definitely some people that may hit that and sort of just take a contextual guess and move on some people that might stop, want to look something up. Some people that, you know, uh, might that might not that might hurt their interest in the book even if they start seeing things they don't understand. Um, so I'm sure you thought about all of this, and and you kind of still decided to 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 do it this way. Um, you know, to what extent were you were you worried about losing people or getting people frustrated or, or that that kind of thing? In the beginning, quite a bit. Um, because I do want the work to be read. If I claim that only a select few should be reading the work, then I'm being silly. But at the same time, I wanted to preserve the place. I wanted the place to sound like how I remembered it, right? But it's also about communication, because I've always had an issue with people assuming everything needs to be understood. If you read poetry, um, you have to take your time with the subject, um, especially if you're reading good, great poetry. Um, why not do that with a book? Um, that's either a novel or a collection, whatever it is. Why not take time? And I thought about that, but at the same time, you could also make the argument that, yeah, but maybe you're reading works that's only in English, using English words that we are all familiar with. And then the minute you start toying with multiple languages, you are going to lose people. I get that. But at the same time, you need to understand that I grew up in a city where you might have a Malayali who speaks Malayalam, a little bit of English, and who has 50 words of Arabic in him when he's working a grocery store, uh, or a kada, like we say in Malayalam. But he can communicate, mm -hmm. right? You may not be able to have an intellectual conversation in Arabic with him if that's your native tongue, but he can communicate. And I wanted to preserve that, and I wanted to acknowledge that. And at the same time, I think guesswork is also interesting especially if you're a reader who does not understand the tongue, then what you do is what we do. Um, you say it out loud, and then you try and figure out what could the word be. And that is an ex exercise in itself that I enjoy personally. And I do realize that it might provide discomfort uh, to some readers, and that's okay. You're allowed to be uncomfortable. 
you're allowed to dislike the work. You must, because if everyone had the same response, and I'd go, Dan, that's boring. Yeah. Uh, because I wanted to make an impact. Because I'd rather have the book, book, sorry, catch fire as you read it, simply because the sentences want to do something, simply because the words want to say stuff, um, rather than it just being a book um, that's a little bit more sedate or been um, given drugs. And I'm not saying, and this is important to say, that writers who write using clear prose are to be dismissed. Of course not. What I'm saying is I can't write like that. Mm -hmm. I don't have the skills to be that. The reason the book sounds the way it does is because the writer sounds like that too. He's a product of the place. And the book is a consequence of that, a consequence of circumstances. Yeah. And I think that also plays into uh, my next question, which is about the form and structure of the book. And it's very interesting. I mean, you mentioned that you were a short story writer and, you know, some of the, so, so the book is essentially full of different short stories. And some of these are less than a page, maybe a paragraph. And some of them, you know, are can maybe 20 pages or something like that at the other end. Um, I feel like there was kind of a rhythm to it almost in the way that you kind of alternated it sometimes between short and long or, or just a different style. You also switched between first, second, and third person. You, you were really playing a lot with, with that. And so I was just kind of wanted to get your general thoughts about why, why you made that decision and how you felt that decision kind of helped make the point you wanted to make about the book. See, there's a word that you use there that's crucial. It's called rhythm. Hmm. And I wanted the work to have rhythm. Um, and you also mentioned that, you know, you identified as a short story writer, was one. Uh, I am one. Uh, and that's what I identify as. So the work started off as a collection. And I'd started off as a collection was meant to be, at least how I was told it was supposed to function. You write a story, you end it. You write another story, you end it. And then we figure out where to put these stories, um, which after a while I got bored by. And I think being at the Art Institute of Chicago was really useful because you have access to the museum. Now, you need to understand that when I was growing up, we didn't have museums. Uh, so I didn't know what to do in a museum. I was taken to a museum for the first time when I was 20 by the late Ted Chesler, my mentor. The book is dedicated to him. And he took me to the Met in New York. And I went with him and I didn't know what to do. So I followed people into these rooms and they were staring at paintings. So I started staring at paintings too, just lingered. And then I sat on a bench because I saw an old guy do the same. So I figured this seems like a fucking good idea, I'll do that. Um, but I didn't know what to do. So I just observed and started mimicking these people who I thought, at least in my head, knew exactly what to do. Then when I went to the Art Institute of Chicago many, many years later, and we had access to the museum, I realized that I loved the building much more than the Met. Uh, sorry, Met fans, uh, <laughs> simply because it allowed me to breathe. Uh, it felt like less chaotic, mm. not as hectic. And I could walk, sit, and observe. And it hit me then, uh, probably not on the first day, but maybe months later, that I wanted to curate the work. I wanted each piece to talk to the other piece. And as you moved from one piece to the other, you started conjuring up this room or these realms in your mind as you read my work. Um, and I wanted that. I wanted that because spaces in the museum did that to me. Um, and I wanted the book to operate like that. So it seemed like a wonderful idea, but difficult to implement when I tried it uh, because it was fucking hard. So then I decided to break the book up into three pieces. So in my head, at least in my mind, it's a triptych. Mm. So you have book one, uh, limbs. You have book two, tongue. You have book three, weed, which is the Malayalam word for home. And that made sense. And also I realized that some of the shorter pieces that you just mentioned and the occasional longer one um, needed help. Uh, they weren't as good as I wanted them to be. And they were helped along by the other pieces. So it's like a chorus at the end of the day. I wanted you to hear all the pieces, hear them loud and proud, and I wanted them to linger on you, and in some cases grab onto you like a tick and not mm. let go, uh, because I wanted that experience, because I was trying to remember my city, 
Uh, the city then graciously hosted and raised me. I was trying to acknowledge my parents um, who are still there. And I'm also, I was also writing this in a city that I had just claimed, Chicago. Mm. Um, so all of that mattered. So the architecture of the book, down from even the cover, um, is intentional. Um, the way the stories or the pieces or the chapters are arranged, that's intentional. Uh, the way everything moves is intentional. But like I said, l- um, just like with languages, some of the chapters are also broken, but they're operational. That's mm. the word. I like that, broken but operational. So I want to move in and talk about the content of the book itself and, and get into some of the stories and, and what they mean, what they reference. And so I'll, I'll start this off by asking about birds. Yeah. Uh, what, and the story birds was, was sort of on its face about construction workers and they couldn't die. And, and there was a nurse called Anna that kind of would, would tape them up uh, after they fell. And one of the things that I really found interesting was the indifference people on the street had towards these workers. So, you know, the workers would fall from their construction site. They couldn't die, but they just sort of sat there, maybe waited for Anna, and people saw them and ignored them. You know, people would walk around or maybe kind of point at them, take a photo. It's not, they weren't really sure what to do with them. And I thought that was really powerful. Just, uh, you know, my experience living in New York is that that happens all the time. Yeah. And I, I guess I was just curious to know what you felt it said about our our capacity for empathy and and especially empathy towards people we don't know or don't understand and maybe how that connects with Anna and, and what she obviously had, you know, maximal empathy here. I mean, this she was just connecting with them on a, such a deep level, um, you know, how was she able to overcome and overcome that potential lack of empathy? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you picked up on that because Birds was hard to write. Um, when I wrote it, I was writing it in response to narratives that I was reading about the Gulf or the Khalij with respect to construction workers. Uh, and a number of those reports are necessary. But at the same time, it was always just that, reports. I didn't know what their names were most of the time, or even if I knew what their names were, it ended with what their professions were. Construction worker, or a laborer, or plumber, and there was little else. Or the stories that you got after that was possibly how they moved to the Gulf, or were duped into going to the Gulf. Um, And they were bleak stories. And I wanted to write something that wasn't necessarily happy, but I wanted to write something that allowed the reader to escape the realm of the worker and to go elsewhere, where the worker was someone else, um, a brother, uh, a mother, a son, an uncle, uh, an idiot, you know, a savant, anything, um, simply because I felt it was important. Also, you see, when I was growing up, uh, visibility and invisibility always fascinated me because my parents trained me and my sibling to behave, not because anyone was mean or the government mandated that you behave, simply because they were afraid, as I guess first or second generation migrants usually are. Uh, And so they instructed us to follow the rules um, as much as possible. But we also lived in a city back in the day that was being built by a people, uh, a certain kind of people, who most of the time looked like me, brown skin, you know, hazel or black eyes. They looked like me, or they looked like my mother, or my father, or my uncle. But we ignored them. Mm. And I wasn't sure why we ignored them. We knew they were there, um, but they weren't there. It's as though we weren't pretending. We knew what the ritual was. And I guess that's the key word, ritual. I was always uh, always fascinated by what the ritual was and has been. So when I wrote Birds, I figured, all right, I need a storyteller. I need a storyteller who just incidentally happens to be a worker. But what he is primarily is a storyteller. And I used to live in New York, you see, Um, and it's my city. And I used to live in Chicago. It's my city, too. And every time I would walk these cities because I adore walking, I'd see people, ask for things, or tell you things, or write things on cardboard boxes that they'd hold up uh, and offer things to you with respect to where they were coming from, what they needed, that they deserved to be paid attention to. And I would sometimes. Other times I wouldn't. 
And that was intentional. It's not because I didn't see them. It's because I was tired. I didn't know what to do. There's a bleakness to observing inequity. And you don't know what to do with yourself. And, you know, I was raised by folks who weren't rich. Um, my father was useless with money. Um, so I understood what it was like to be poor. Um, and also mentally bereft of anything close to hope. But because I understood it, I also wanted to walk away from it. Mm. I didn't want to see it in anyone else, um, simply because I was afraid that I'd return to it periodically. And I think that's part of the problem, because when you see people um, who are not as privileged as you are, and in most cases that's, that is the situation, you don't know what to fucking do with yourself, right? And I wanted birds to explore that. Um, but at the same time, I also wanted it to reinvent certain narratives of what the worker could be. And I genuinely believe that. The worker is a person. The worker is other things and deserves to be. The worker has a name. It would be nice to know what those names are and where they came from. So the story Phone is about a character named Johnny Cuddy and uh, I would think jealousy and uh, and the talk the story talks about a magical phone that people can use to see see things and and Johnny uses this magical phone to speak with his wife and when he's speaking with his wife he can see that there's somebody else there and and you know s slowly starts to find out that uh, she was cheating on him and this obviously causes, you know, causes problems. And I thought it might be interesting to hear, I, you know, may, maybe there was some genesis there, maybe that came from somewhere. So I thought it would be interesting for you to talk about a time when you, know, you found out something that was hidden from you. That's a good question. You see, the phone has always been, no pun intended, instrumental to my family. Mm. Um, because the phone told you things. And the phone is what he picked up in order to find out what was going on back in the homeland. So I'm going to do something here. So you called it phone, uh, which is the title of the piece, and you're right. But at the same time, in my head, this is what it sounds like. Phone, because that's what it sounds like in Malayalam, mm. um, at least in, when my father says it. And Johnny Kadi, uh, the way a Malayali would say it, would be Johnny Kutti. So when I read this piece out, it would be phone with Johnny Kutti. Um, and that does things to me, you know, and the story registers differently when I read it like that. But back to the phone, the phone has always been important. I picked up the phone when my uncle called to inform my father that my mother's mother had died. Mm. Um, my father picked up the phone when he got a call saying that his mother had fallen off her cot and had broken, I guess, her hip and she was now in a coma or unconscious, I don't remember exactly. So the phone was always the instrument that told you someone was about to pass, mm. or if you were lucky, someone was being someone had been born. Um, and I wanted to explore that. And also when I left the UAE for the States, I came in 2001, two weeks before 9-11, which is wonderful timing. And then after I returned in 2002, and then I didn't go back for five and a half years. Mm. So the phone was all I was there. And when I spoke to my parents, we hid things from each other. I was lonely. I was homesick. I wanted to touch my mum, but I never let her know that. But she knew that. So we'd have this very strange conversation where I'd go, how are you, mum? And she'd say, I'm fine. How are you, son? And I'd say, I'm fine. Well, we both weren't fine. We mm. missed each other. We wanted to tell each other stuff, but we relied on tropes and cliches because it was easier. And they kept stuff from me as well. Because in my head, I figured if I left, that's one mouth less to feed and they'll be financially better off. And that wasn't what happened. And as far as my parents were concerned, because I was in the States, I'd graduate and I'd find that job, um, lift them out of financial poverty, and I would be fine. And that didn't happen either. Mm. So fauna or phone is about all of that. It's about sadness, but it's also about joy because that's what you do when you wanted to inform family, a family member that something wonderful had happened to you. 
So switching from from maybe joy, uh, this this uh, story anniversary is just very macabre play, and it involves the people of this village kind of carrying out this play with with all kinds of crazy things happening. Uh, they have to run someone over and over and over again, and they have to set the person on fire over and over and over again. And the people of the village take part in this uh, every year over and over again, seemingly without end. And it, it feels like it's been it's been sort of normalized into a routine that just happens. And so I guess I was curious to know if you know to to have you talk about the self destructive nature of, of that routine. You know, do we need something like that? Do 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 we have self destructive routines in our lives? I think so. Um, I've always been fascinated by violence, but violence that was internalized. Uh, violence that doesn't look like violence, but I believe it truly is. And I'll give you an example. Well, when I was in my late teens, um, I went to a shopping mall in Abu Dhabi, I forget which one, and I went to use a restroom. And there was a gentleman there who was handing out napkins and you know, cleaning the sink um, or mopping the floors after someone had finished. And I understood then and there that the man was trained to disappear. He was there, but at the same time, he wasn't there. Um, everything that he did, down to the mopping, to the cleaning, to where he stood, was done with such efficiency, but at the same time, uh, with such mournfulness and sadness that I didn't know what to do with myself. Mm. Um, and I thought, this is probably one of the most violent things ever. But that didn't register when I was there. It registered years later, simply because... I wanted to acknowledge him, but at the same time, I didn't want to be patronizing. And I didn't want to wash my hands and turn to him and say, thank you. But at the same time, I did want to do that. Yeah. Say, thank you, and mean it. And I wanted him to know that I meant it. But I was also projecting, um, because I wanted to feel better about myself rather than do anything for this gentleman, right? And I always thought about that, and I wondered, how can I write about violence that appears overt, but also comical at the same time? And what does, the, what does this do to you as an individual? And you have to understand that again, I'm going to reference New York and Chicago. When I was in New York, my body behaved differently uh, after a few months. I walked quicker, I stopped smiling. I knew how to maneuver myself into space when I was using the subway. And then when I moved to Chicago the first day, I think the first day, a woman smiled at me on the L train and I thought she was fucking crazy okay. uh, simply because I'd forgotten what I had become. I'd become the quintessential New Yorker, right? Yeah. So in Abu Dhabi, I used to be something. There's a certain kind of behavior. Not everyone behaves the same way, but it's possible that some of them do. And I wondered what it was like or what it, what it would be like to escape that, mm. irrespective of which city you were in, uh, whether it's New York, whether it's Chicago, uh, whether it's Abu Dhabi. And that story might be exactly that. I thought of it as what I call my IKEA experiment. If you've ever been, they have these arrows uh, that you have to follow to get from point A to point B. And I like walking in the opposite direction because it fucks people up. Yeah. And they look at you as if, what are you doing, man? I mean, this is, this is not cool. Yeah. And I like that. Yeah, that's great. I think, well, I was uh, one of the things you said when you were dealing with the bathroom attendant, and that you wanted part of it was it was self serving. You wanted to make yourself feel better about the situation. Yeah, and I think that's that's interesting because I I think that happens to a lot of us. It definitely happens to me when when we're not sure about something or we want to we want to help, but the helping also comes with that sense of satisfaction that, oh, look at me, I'm a responsible, good person, and I do good things. And maybe that comes in sort of the opposite way in, in the story anniversary, right? As opposed mm -hmm. to them, they're, they're the, that's the ultimate irresponsibility, right. but they're all doing it, and maybe they, maybe they feel like they're helping each other, helping this person out. 
I think that's that's uh, maybe another another layer on there. Yeah, I mean, it's also about power and privilege, right? Mm. Uh, yeah. th- which is something I've always been aware of when I was little, how much privilege or power I had uh, as a young man and how much privilege or power my father had as a brown man and how much privilege and power I have now that I'm an ad- adult with my accent. The way I talk is a construction, right? Because I thought this is what you had to sound like in order to be heard. Mm-hmm. Um, this is not my voice when I was 10. It was different. What we were told by our teachers, especially in school, if you want to learn your English right, uh, watch the BBC. Um, and we also had American television. Mm-hmm. So I figured, all right, I'm going to do something here with my tongue in order, t- in, in order to be heard. And there's all of that. Uh, because the anniversary is also about that. It is about privilege and power and how privilege and power can be upturned by characters or reappropriated by mm. characters uh, simply because you believe someone to be um, working a job that you wouldn't work uh, doesn't necessarily mean that this individual um, does not have agency. It means the individual might be unhappy, mm. uh, but that's okay. But, you know, like you said... Um, I'm dealing with my own shit and I'm trying to be happy uh, by pretending that I can help someone else and I probably wouldn't see this person again. And I never did. I didn't see the same person again, right? Yeah. So what are the malice and and how does betrayal factor into our lives? You had to ask me an easy question, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, you see... My father's a migrant. My mother's a migrant. I'm a migrant. My grandparents were migrants. And I wonder about betrayal a lot. Because when we inhabit a place, you assume that the place claims you quickly or will claim you soon after, five, ten years after. And when that doesn't happen, um, I didn't know how to react, or when that didn't happen, I didn't know how to react. And here's why I say this. Because my parents trained us well to leave, programmed us to leave. When I did leave, I expected to be free of everything, of the land, of the people, of the place. And I ended up remembering everything that I left. And I ended up feeling broken. And that was unexpected. Because like I said, I went to an Indian school in a Gulf country. We were trained to be Indians. That's what I thought I was until I came to the States. And I felt betrayed by my parents Mm. that they hadn't prepared me for this um, because I needed some sort of preparation. But I also learned to understand what my own parents had gone through because my father arrived in the UAE in his early 20s, a year after the Federation was formed. And my mother joined him after they got married, and she was, I think, 20. Um, But they left places that they adored and cherished, that they had claimed for a while. And this was happening to me now, when I left and I was in the States. And I wish my father had told me, but he's not much of a talker. Mm. Uh, And my mother is a talker, but she didn't realize that this could possibly be a problem. So betrayal was that was not being able to go back because my parents didn't prepare me. So I didn't know what to do with myself, right? But at the same time, betrayal is also about the kind of lies that you tell yourself in order to function in a place, which is what I did when I was in the States, when I couldn't see my own family, Um, because you have to betray, betray the things you used to be. I speak to friends of mine now when I'm back in Abu Dhabi, Uh, because I've returned for a wee bit. Oh, I speak to cousins, they tell me I have an American accent. Hmm. If you hear this podcast, I'm pretty sure you're not going to say that. I don't. But there are certain words that have American inflections. So I grew up saying the word pass as pass. But when I speak to friends of mine who are, you know, through and through American, I might say pass. It does happen. So there are moments when the Americanisms actually stand up and say, I'm here. Hmm. Right. As much as the Britishisms do the same uh, and the Indianisms do the same. So is that betrayal, too? I don't know. Uh, I think what's happened is I've become this 
in I guess in Hindi, I think it's a Hindi word, it's called chutney. Uh, this chutney of things, this product of things, this creature of cities. Uh, some people might call that a betrayal because I haven't picked a country. I don't think I ever will. Uh, mm. I don't identify as Indian uh, because I've never lived there, even though I have an Indian passport. Uh, I'm not Imarathi. I cannot be. I'm not Arab, um, certainly, but that's not a country. I'm not an American. What I've done instead is I've done something that makes me feel safe. I've picked cities, Abu Dhabi, New York, Chicago. I'm a creature of cities. And my parents might call that a betrayal um, because as far as they're concerned, I'm Indian. Hmm. What are the Malu? So my parents are from Kerala, um, which is, I think, in the southwest of India. Ge geography has never been my strong suit. Pretty sure it's southwest. And people from Kerala are called Malayalis. And that comes from the language, which is Malayalam, which is a palindrome. So Malus is basically short form for Malayali. And, you know, it's, almost, it's a slang almost, you could say. So when I say, he's a Malu, he's a Malu, he's a Malu, it just means that they're all Malayalis. Hmm. That, that's what it is. Okay. Um, it's like, honestly, it's like looking at someone or me looking at you and going, you're a New Yorker. Um, and if someone looked at me and said, hey, are you Malu? I'm like, I'm Malu. That's, that's basically what it is. So maybe that connects in with your response to betrayal a little bit because you are, that's picking something. You know, you're defining yourself as this thing. Yeah. And just by agreeing to that or not agreeing to that, that can be part of the betrayal you were talking about. Yeah, you're right. I'm also acknowledging my Maluness, right? Um, I am Malu. If someone asks me, are you Malu, man? I'm like, you bet. I'm Malu. But at the same time, if they say, so that means you're Indian, I'm like, no, I'm not. Mm. Uh, and here's why I say that, because the book operates the way it does, simply because it is a writer using languages. And Malayalam is the first language I heard. It is the language of my parents. It is their tongue. Um, and I use it. I speak to my parents in Malayalam. I don't speak to them in anything else. I mean, of course, English does make its entry, you could say, but uh, Malayalam is the language of my family. Um, and I am Malu, and I'm proud of it. I'm not denying that at all. The betrayal factor might be when people assume that I will be taking the next step or telling you what is expected of a proud Indian, mm -hmm. then, then I'm Indian too. And th there I draw the line. I say, no, I'm not. I've taken the language, um, and the language is mine. Uh, but the country, I don't fully understand. And I say that respectfully, uh, because I don't think I've done enough work to be part of the nation. I've lived in the States far longer than I've ever lived in India, and I've lived in the States for over 15 years and counting, mm -hmm. right? So technically that makes me more American than Indian, uh, but I don't say that either. Mm. So I want to talk a little bit, bit about uh, Le Musee because I thought that story was absolutely fascinating. And I, I wasn't able to look into this beforehand, but so maybe talk about Le Musee and then talk about is it related to anything that actually happened or did you come up with that? Actually happened in respect to people being imprisoned in this camp and yeah, yeah. forced to be observed. It was, Right. No, no it's not okay. Because right. it really, it's so, yeah, and you gave away what it's about. But <laughs> this, this story is just, it's so, uh, you'll read it and, you, and you'll just, you get it such vivid imagery from it that it felt like you took it out of the news. Right. Really I mean, look, but at the same time, um, you know, back in the day, I forget the name uh, of this poor fellow, but I believe he was a Congolese pygmy who was brought over to the States and paraded around as a circus animal mm. um, and I'd read about this and I wondered about the act of display what it means to be observed or to be seen or to be seen in a certain light and the expectations people have of you and even zoos I'm not a big fan of zoos yeah, uh, for this either. reason yeah. simply because you go especially if you go to the monkey cages or if you go where the apes are on display and there's a certain expectation that the visitor has especially if they're seeing a chimpanzee, and they do things. You know, they mimic the ape. 
but at the same time um they're pretending to be an ape hoping that the ape pretends to be an ape too uh and that has always bothered me but at the same time you know um i live i'm from a city where because we're trained to leave i had always wondered about what kind of memory might be left behind of us and i say us us loosely uh, because i want my parents to be remembered um i don't think i will be remembered and that's that's all right but i want some sort of document that addresses what my parents did in the gulf as creatures or inhabitants of the gulf and i wanted to write a story about that um uh, but i didn't know how to do it so i thought about voyeurism i suppose simply because i was reading narratives where people were telling me when i say people i mean writers were actually telling me what the gulf was supposed to be uh this is it it's just skyscrapers and lamborghinis or camels and oil drums um or you know abuse but i had known a very different city um a city that had more nuance and i wondered about that so i wanted to play with that voyeurism um what kind of a voyeur would i like my characters to be or could that be even be turned into a concept the act of voyeurism because that's what you do when you go to a museum at the end of the day you're looking mm-hmm. um you're looking at stuff you're staring you're also looking at other people looking at stuff which is what i did when i first went right that's interesting to me um and i wanted to play with that um so the fact that you think it could have been real or might be real i'll take that yeah um, i think you've just made my afternoon <laughs> <laughs> fair enough i mean yeah just just the and again to summarize it you know, these people are are kidnapped and sort of made to be kind of caged animals and and this character the commander separates husbands and wives and brothers and sisters and then puts them with other husbands and wives and other brothers and sisters and and things start happening and you wrote about the things that started happening as part of the perils of being human and i i really i really enjoyed that phrase i it, it it's t- full of meaning i think and so i'd like to hear from you you know what you think the perils of being human are you know i think um there are certain things that we turn to when we're desperate we assume we are going to be only one kind of person because my father says you know i'm an indian that's what i'll always be but i've always been interested in individuals who didn't have the privilege to say that um the writer alexander hemen is an interesting example uh, because he was in the states uh when what was then uh, the former yugoslavia was undergoing what could be loosely termed as chaos um and he had to learn english he writes in english now but he writes a certain way in a certain way that i've always admired and respected um it's as though he had to tame a language he didn't fully understand or the language had to sort of tame his own impulses um and that's fascinating to me right so the perils of being human oh god i mean i, I don't know i know it's difficult to be in a place that is not yours especially when you're a migrant slash immigrant When I came to the states I was petrified terrified um simply because I didn't know how to behave but and so what I would do as a student is I would talk to anybody or try to be heard I would listen in on conversations and if I heard Malayalam or Arabic my ears would just you know perk up and go hey I know that tongue I want that tongue where is it coming from mm. um so there's this desperation at the same time we also make decisions we're not proud of um and i've done that especially if you're a creature of documents like i've always been mm-hmm. and an example of that would be not too long ago my sister gave me a call and told me that my uh, our mother had been taken into intensive care and whether i could come so at the time you understand my paperwork was being processed and what i asked her was um is it all right if i don't but my sister sort of helped she said don't worry she'd expect you to stay Uh I don't think that was the case. Hmm. My mom would have wanted me there, but she never would have said it. So I just took that as an excuse to remain. And my mother is still alive, but I'll never forget the decision I made, right? 
And I made that decision because I wanted paperwork. I wanted to return to the States. I didn't want to be in limbo again. Um, and as the oldest child in my family, there are certain expectations and responsibilities. I adore my mother or my amma. Um, but I decided to let her go. Um, and I decided to favor paperwork over her. Uh, that's what I've become. I've become this fucking cultural mercenary who's interested in documents or documentation. Um, and I have to live with that. I, I've always realized I'm not perfect. But I also didn't realize that I was a little bit of a shitbag also. And that was sobering, right? Because I don't know what to do anymore. Because apologizing to my mom isn't the right thing to do. Because it doesn't make any sense. Mother understands. But this is what I've this is what I've become. Yeah. Uh, so you could also say or state or claim uh, that the work or the piece, the musée, examines that too. Examines the state that you think you'll never be in, but end up finding yourself in, and the decisions you have to make um, when you find yourself in those situations. And I'll end with this: when I'm at the airport, I'm always pissed off. When I get scrutinized a bit uh, longer than I need to be. But if someone else gets scrutinized, I go, thank God. It's, you know, it's his turn now. Mm -hmm. It's her turn now. And I'm sort of happy. That's schadenfreude. Right, right, exactly. And that doesn't make me feel very good about myself. Mm -hmm. um, and it also helps me understand what I really am. Yeah. So throughout the book, there's a theme that I saw of uh, of different animals attempting to become more human. <laughs> and they wanted to try and learn to walk or talk. And maybe just comment generally on, on, on that idea of kind of aspirations to something greater. Um, but I also want to specifically focus on the, the cockroach story and specifically the character of the general and talk about that character for a bit. So I've always loved insects and animals. Uh, I think they're quite wonderful because they can do things that I can't do. Or whether it's a lizard's tongue, you know, or, or a bird's wings, there are possibilities there. But this is also a shout out to my great grandma and grandmother because I was raised on tales where animals did things and it was normal. There was not, nothing fantastical about it. So that's what the pigeon does and that's what the fucking parrot does. And it made sense to me. Like, I want to try something. And if you have ever read the Panchatantra, uh, which is, I guess, a series of folk tales that are strung together but recited by animals, um, you'll understand that there's a lot of joy in the telling of stories by animals, which is why Bladla Germanica operates the way it does. But to your question, your specific question about the general, I think the general is me. Because mm. uh, when I was little, um, I wanted to be heard by my parents. But at the same time, I also wanted to be heard by the city. I wanted to be acknowledged. But at the same time, I was categorized or classified because I'm brown. And the only thing I could be was Indian. And I wanted to be other things. And I realized as I aged that because I didn't do anything properly, like I don't speak... Hindi fluently, but I speak it. But I have to translate it from English to Malayalam to Hindi. So if you're not patient, we're not going to have a conversation. Arabic I can read and I can write, but I don't know what you're saying. But there are certain things that I do know. Again, we're not going to have a conversation, right? Tamil, which Malayalam is a derivative of, I can sort of get because the cadences and the intonations are similar-ish. Again, we're not going to have a conversation. Um, then there's Malayalam the language of my parents, my family. There's all of this, and I'm a product of all of this. The sentences in the book are a product of all of this. And when I was little, I didn't know what to do with this, right? So I'd just listen to things. And the general um, is me trying to take control of all of that. But that's how it started off, and then the character becomes something else, uh, and the character becomes the character, and I have to step back a little bit and allow the character to do whatever the character wishes to do. And that was fun, too. Uh, and, you know, the general is also grotesque. 
uh, an anomaly almost, a white roach, right? A white Blattula Germanica. And when I came to the States, that's what I felt like. I felt like I was being mm. othered, that I had to be something. Remember, I told you I got here two weeks before 9-11. Um, and I didn't know what the Twin Towers were, the significance. I knew people had died or were murdered, uh, and the nation was sad. Um, but for the first time, people started asking me what it was like to be Arab, or what the Arabs thought of us, us being Americans. Now, you see, for someone who had always been branded an Indian, to be asked that question simply because people knew I came from the Gulf was shocking. I didn't know what to do with myself. So I answered the question um, or questions pretending that I was the resident expert. And that's what I mean by being other because that's what they thought I was. I could only be Arab. But here's the deal. In Abu Dhabi, when I was a boy, I was Indian. In India, I was the boy from Abu Dhabi. In the States, you know, I was the Indian from Abu Dhabi. And no one got it right. I am from Abu Dhabi. That's it. I'm from New York now and Chicago. That's it. And I think the general is an exploration of not just a product of cities, but a product of languages. Hmm. Yeah, and as he goes through his explorations, he starts to learn our language, you know, and starts to speak language and teaches that to the other cockroaches and you know becomes this force where he's leading them because of that because he becomes human because he learns language yeah that's right also what's interesting is since we're talking about it now i think i just realized that the general then becomes my father mm. uh, because the general's intent honestly is to leave something behind um, whether it's language or whether it's ritual and for me when i was growing up in abu dhabi i never fully understood or comprehended what it must have been like for my parents to leave the homeland. I understand it now, simply because I have returned to Abu Dhabi. I teach at New York University, Abu Dhabi. And when I'm in classes with my own students, um, I tell them things and I sound like my father. I say, well, back in the day, in the 80s, this used to be here, it's no longer here. That's what my father used to do when he used to take us to Kerala. And I never paid attention, right? So as I was writing the piece, it started off as being me, then the me became just the general. And I'm realizing now that the, the general, at the end of it, ended up being my father. Because mm. the book is also that. I'm trying to leave something behind for my family. Just like my parents left something behind for us, which you could claim to be sacrifice and stories. Mm. The story Kada, Kadha and Karakaran is about fate. So I'm curious to hear what you think uh, the role of fate plays in our lives. Oh boy, how much time do we have? <laughs> so here's what I'm going to do again. Yeah. Um, I'm going to tell you or recite well, how it sounds like. Okay. So it would be kada, which is shop, kada, which is story. And this is my favorite word, probably. Karakaran which means shopkeeper, right? Fate, which in Malayalam is also vidhi, has always been really, really important, I guess, to my family. Because my parents always believed things would be okay, things would be all right, even though things weren't okay, things weren't all right. They struggled quite a bit, but they did their best also to not allow us to understand the financial constraints under which they operated as a family. Um, but I guess they also had their faith. You know, when we were raised Hindus, I don't believe anymore. Uh, but it always struck me how belief played such a huge role in their lives and how we were raised with it. Uh, and there's a certainty that my parents always had about sorting through the mess and coming out okay, which I didn't. I don't think I still had that. But at the same time, you know, to, um, back to your question, fate, what role does it play in our lives? I don't know, man, but mm. I can talk about luck. And okay. I think luck is really important to me because when I went or when I was trying to go to the U.S., when you go to the consulate in Abu Dhabi, you have to go with documentation. 
you have to go with financial documentation as well, which means you have to sh- highlight you have a certain amount of money in the bank. And if you don't have that much money in the bank, your visa, your F1 visa, which is a student visa, gets rejected. My father borrowed money from his brother's business partner, I think the two days before the interview, which basically meant my visa would have been rejected if I was interviewed. I wasn't interviewed. Hmm. The only thing that happened was I walked over to the consulate. I showed them my documentation. Um, the officer saw that I was accepted. No questions, nothing. He just say, stop by tomorrow or two days later and get to collect your visa. I have no fucking idea why that happened, right? The o- maybe, um, yeah, I have no fucking idea how that happened because my mother, all she did was she ironed my shirt, my underwear, and my trousers. And I wasn't interviewed. Mm. That's how I ended up in the States. Before um, I graduated with an undergrad degree from Fairleigh Dickinson University, um, I thought I had to return, go home. I called my father up and he said, don't come back. Find a job, um, please. Yeah. And that's how, that's how he phrased it. Find a job, please. And I didn't know what to do. But and this woman who, was a, who is a friend of mine, Gayatri Atakin, um, allowed me to live in her apartment for free for over a year to sort myself out. And then when I started attending graduate school at Fairleigh Dickinson, she didn't charge me rent. Uh, and because I had a job on campus, I was allowed to study and just concentrate on what was important. All of this is luck, mm-hmm. circumstantial, right? And then in 2008, my father ended up winning the Abu Dhabi Duty Free Lottery. That's how he paid off his debts. So for the first time, I had the privilege to think and to reflect on what I wanted to do if I wanted to write about the Gulf or the Khalij. Because up to that point, I was thinking about how to save my parents. And I didn't have to do that anymore, right? And given that my book, Temporary People, is coming out in a time when the U.S. is under the presidency of Donald Trump, the fact that migrant narratives or narrative is sexy um, is also circumstantial and fortunate. And I have to acknowledge that. Because if I don't acknowledge that, what I'm saying is I've written a masterpiece that was acknowledged to be one by everybody, and that's the reason I got published. I also got lucky. I had very generous teachers, and since I've given a few shout-outs, uh, I have to give a shout-out to Ted Chesler, the late Ted Chesler. The book's dedicated to him. Um, he allowed me to, ta- uh, th- to think, and he allowed me to be, and worry about nothing else uh, rather than being a human being who wanted to write something of substance. So fate, I have not a clue about. Mm. But luck, I can talk to you about luck all day uh, because I'm writing from a position of privilege. To write um, is basically to be in a position of privilege. And the only reason I have that is because of good fortune, uh, not because I'm special. Yeah. And it, it's interesting to think then that perhaps something that writers should think about is that position and how they can then use that to illuminate the plight of those that aren't as privileged. And I think your book does a very good job of that, and that's that's a theme that I sense within it. So is there anything else that you... Anything, anything you really hoped people would get out of this book that we didn't talk about? Plenty. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe your, their top, top thing or two. So I hope that people don't look at this book and think of it as a how-to manual on what the Gulf is or what the Khalij is. It's not. I hope people don't pick up the book and go, this is why everything that's wrong with the Gulf um, is wrong with the Gulf because the book is so bleak and the book is so mournful and the book is so sad. My hope is people look at this and go, here is an artist who's a product of the Gulf, who acknowledges the Gulf with a little bit of grace and a little bit of rage, and who just happens to be one of the first writers to come out with a book in English that looks at the place 
I say happens to be because there are others uh, down the pipeline who are coming. Um, Tanaz Batena, the writer, will come out with a book next year. There are visual artists, Lantanji or Lee, Raja Khalid, the art critic Murtaza Vali, the writer-researcher Ahmad Makia, and the poet whose book is called The Prom- Promised Land. His name is Andre Nahis, Nafis Saheli. I've mangled his last name, but Penguin's putting out his book um, a few months from now. And I'm mentioning these names because I hope what the book does is that it starts conversation. It's not a book about confrontation. It's a book about conversation. And that other works will not only respond to the book, but also use the book as an instrument to talk about things that these writers wish to talk about and do it better. Mm. That's the hope. Um, It's a product of the place. It's a product of places. It's a product of cities. And it's also a product of language and languages. so that's what I hope to get out of it. If anyone does read it, trust me, man, I'm grateful. Yeah. Um, because I never expected to be in a position where I do readings or speak to people or talk about myself and really bore myself because that's been difficult. Um, so thank you is what I'm saying to anyone who turns these pages. Great. Well, I think everyone should because it's an amazing book. And so I want to wrap up with what I call the thunder route and just some fun little questions sort of one epic question at the end and right. uh, then we'll call it a day. Sound good? Yeah. Let's All do right. It. So what's your favorite food or drink? <laughs> Depends on the day. Uh, there's something that my mom makes called sambar, uh, which is a lentil soup. That with rice and papadam makes my day. But I also need my hummus, man, and shawarma. Yeah. Uh, drink, Agreed. buttermilk, or iran uh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Any day of the week. Yeah. Done. So we've kind of crisscrossed through the places you've lived, but do you have a favorite place that you've ever been? Is it one of the places you've lived or somewhere else that you've just seen? It's hard for me to attach myself to a place because I'm afraid that I'd love it too much. Mm -hmm. Right? Any place, any city that allows me to walk, I adore. New York has a special place in my heart simply because of that. Chicago too. And my favorite season is winter. Oh, interesting. Um, simply because, you know, people don't really get out much when it snows, and that's when I get out. Ah. So any city that allows me to walk is a city that I can actually live in. Yeah, agreed. So I like to ask everyone this question because it's very interesting, and it's tricky because you have to pick. So if you could wave a magic wand and change any one thing, what would it be and Why? <laughs> oh man I wish I could be back to being a little boy every time my parents took me back to Kerala and remember things better and then return to adulthood because I think that would have been really useful for not just a book but for me uh, because there was a certain arrogance with which I dismissed my father and my mother when we returned to the homeland So if I could return to being that little boy or every time that little boy went to Kerala and just pay fucking attention, um, I think it would have been useful. Yeah, great. So I want to say thanks again to Deepak Unikrishnan for being on the show. His book, Temporary People, is out now, right? Yeah, it's 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 been a week and change. yeah. Yeah, so you can go buy it everywhere books are sold. It is an amazing, wonderful book. And thank you again, Deepak, for being on the show. Oh, thanks, John. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Read, Learn, Live. If you liked it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. If you hated it, tell a friend and subscribe on iTunes and Google Play. And so it goes. (laughs) 